In 2019, uh, a director of the Dijkstraalen in Hamburg, Dirk Luko, came to my studio proposing an exhibition. I said, great, uh, I'll be happy to do it. I haven't shown in Germany for a long time. Uh, this turned out to be a much bigger event than I expected. He said, well, we'll send our curator, Sabine Schnackenberg, to, to look at your work and we'll make a show. He said, we have 70 of your pictures in our collection and we'll make a show from 1960 to 1986. I said, no, I want a show from 1960 to 2023. And so this he was agreed upon. Sabine came to my studio and uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't feeling well. And so I had my assistant give her carte blanche to go through all my files and boxes. Something I had never done in my entire career of maybe 250 one-man shows. I always controlled, like my books. I am obsessed with the idea of being autonomous. All the credit, all the blame, I am responsible. So Sabine comes and starts editing this work, selecting what she likes. And then the pandemic comes, the show is put back three, four years until all of a sudden it opens and I walk through the Dijkte Hallen and now I just walk through the Kunstfeuer and I'm seeing my work in a way that very few photographers have the opportunity. I was asked what I thought about the show in the Dijkte Hallen and I tried to explain the fact that I had all these feelings that I was experiencing all of them at the same time. And now, six months later, a year later, whatever it is, eight months later, looking at this incredible installation here, all the way up to 2023, uh, I realized that, for example, I'm speaking English, maybe I know 10,000 words in English. I don't remember them all, but they're there. And it's the same thing as looking at 300 photographs made over 60 years. I don't remember everything I felt, but I'm feeling it. Just imagine how happy I am to have this opportunity to walk through this exhibition with you and discuss some of my observations. Uh, it's a strange feeling moving so far back in time when I was so young making these pictures, remembering how I felt about photography during this period. And it's interesting, after I came out of the Navy, I went to art school, and many of these photographs are the ones I made in 1960, 1961. And I thought I wanted to be a documentary photographer because that's what the art of photography was in 1960. And I tried to learn the documentary skills, camera handling with the Leica. And I look through these photographs and what happens is that I remember how I used to feel about something. And you know, before we go through this exhibition, I want to say one thing, is that there are many photographs here, 300, taken for many different reasons. But now, 65 years later, I realize that it's not the photograph that I'm so concerned with anymore. It's the effect that the photograph produces. And when I look at that, and I look at the evolution of the work, I look at the themes, the continuities, the visual attitudes that sustain throughout the decades. I come away from this exhibition feeling uh, encouraged to continue. So in this period, all I was trying to do was learn how to handle a Leica, how to be quick, how to be light, how to move delicately with the camera, and I decided it was like an instrument, a musical instrument. 
I decided it was going to be my Stradivarius. It would be capable of doing anything I was capable of asking the camera to do. So I worked in art school for a while, and then I moved to Los Angeles, and we're talking about uh, 1962, 63. But uh, I, I realized I was never gonna have a career in Los Angeles, so I moved to New York in 1967, uh, and I was introduced to Magnum where I became a photojournalist. But it wasn't very interesting for me. It was not to be my destiny. I had met Robert Frank and was helping him on his films, learning from the, another great master, and uh, my work started changing and it became surreal. And I started looking at these pictures, which eventually became my first book entitled The Somnambulist. It was about a dream. Now I still had many of the camera handling techniques that I had originally developed, but I was pointing my camera in another direction. Uh, Dorothea Lang had taught me that you must always have a point of departure when you're working, something you're looking for. So while I was working on the dream sequence, I started thinking, is this, is this picture, is this hand, is this horse, is this pipe? Are these part of my dream? I had a point of departure. So uh, I was living in New York at the Chelsea Hotel, and I worked for three years on this book from 67 to 70. And it came out, and uh, I was recognized for, for doing this. And so at the end of the Somnambulist series, there were a few pictures left over that looked different. And uh, that was called Deja Vu. Now we'll go to Deja Vu. So the Somnambulist was very well received. Three months after the book appeared, uh, I started being able to travel to Europe and I started getting little grants and I was definitely on my way. And I had a few pictures left over that did not fit in the somnambulist. And I had learned while I was working on the dummy of the, the maquette of the somnambulist to really look at my photographs for long periods of time. And it was the first time I had done that as a photographer. Uh, Self-editing is something that, that is extremely important to, to photographers. And it is quite often the, the weakest point in their creative process. In my case, uh, I spend weeks, months, years before I release a photograph. So at least I have come to my own personal uh, set of decisions about any given work. But interestingly, uh, as I was uh, looking at the two-page spread in the Somnambulist, and my work was changing a little bit, uh, I realized that if you have a deja vu, you register, oh, I just had one, as it's disappearing. It's almost as fast as the, the release of a shutter. So I had this photograph of my friend Felipe on the pier in New York. And then I had this photograph of my friend Larry Clark. We were playing with guns in New Mexico. And I thought that the man on the pier could raise his arm and the gesture could be completed 2,000 miles away and then the bullet could go and create a straight line in space. This is where the infrastructure of the book became essential to what I was trying to say. These pictures work on the wall, but on the page when you're holding the book just in front of you, it's vividly clear. Now, the interesting thing about the book as the delivery system is that everybody holds the book within a certain distance, if you're nearsighted, farsighted. But one of the things about the book is that I can control the viewing distance to the idea. So I continued to work on, on Deja Vu. I got a grant to finance the printing. I had made my own publishing house, Lustrum Press. And uh, I like the idea that, that I could think of what was most important in my life at that moment and make that the subject for my, my work, the subject of my next project. So as I had been in the Navy and had a peculiar relationship to eroticism, which was all pretty much internalized when you're on a ship, 
uh, I decided I would work on Days at Sea, and it was going to be a, an erotic, deal with my erotic fantasies. What's interesting about working on one project after the next is that there's a continuity, there's an advancement, there's a, a development of ideas, all built on the previous project. So I wanted to make a third book called Days at Sea, which was going to deal with eroticism. And I had this photograph, which is unfortunately perhaps one of my best known pictures. I have others that may be even stronger than that. But uh, I made that photograph and uh, was thinking about uh, different aspects of eroticism. But what really happened was as I started working on the sequence, I was not really so erotic. I was moving closer to the subject. That's what really occurred with this. So all of a sudden, we have very minor events. The wind blows the tablecloth. The foot is almost going to touch the floor. How many feet touch how many floors in the course of a day on planet Earth? This is not, this is not big news. This is not a big event in the, in the, in the history of humans on planet Earth, but I wanted insignificance. And I have continued to want to separate, remove the event from the photograph to where the, the only event in the photograph is the mere fact that I'm trying to look at anything and understand it. That is the subject of the picture. So I was in the south of France, and I wanted to do a homage to uh, Vincent van Gogh, who went crazy in the hot sun of the south of France. So I said, my point of departure tomorrow will be, I will take a, a photograph at 12 o'clock noon. And I went out, and I discovered this, uh, this architectural detail. And uh, I took it at one meter distance to the camera, which is a close point for the 50 millimeter lens. And when I was printing this, I noticed that the black shape of the shadow on the left was just as important as the uh, architectural information, perhaps even more. And so I started becoming interested in what we call just the language of shapes. Shapes just unto themselves. Uh, all shapes have meaning, and uh, the meaning of all shapes is that. They simply have a meaning. How we use them is to be determined. So I decided to, to do a series entitled Quadrants, where I use a camera like a navigational device, like a sextant that measures the angle between the horizon and the, and the stars. The camera triangulates. And I made this series uh, for my show at Castelli Gallery in 1977. I started in 75, I made my debut in New York in 77, and uh, it was a very interesting series because it would clearly put me in a place that I wanted somehow to isolate, some, somehow to discover. Artists work on an emotional basis, and only after the emotion is somehow expressed does the intellectual definition arrive. It's after looking at the work you produce emotionally that you understand, did I say understand, what you're trying to do. And now that's concrete. That's, that can be developed. So that's what Quadrants did for me. So the frame is always a very important thing for the photographer. Uh, Throughout the years, I, I investigated many approaches to how I was going to frame the picture. Am I going to suggest activity outside of the frame? Uh, at this point, I encountered the priest. And as I, was, as I was framing very carefully with my dual range Sumacron, it had a close-up attachment. I said, are the edges of the frame compressing the subject, or is the subject pushing away from the frame. Uh, 
So that, that is the importance of this picture for me. On the other hand, it is very simple. It is very subtractive. It only has three or four shapes. It has a complete and total social meaning. It deals with religion, aesthetics, composition. This is a photograph. I just realized uh, last week I decided that in my, my new work, what I want to do is I want to put the center of the composition on the edge of the frame. Not sure I know exactly what that means, but that's an idea that probably now I realize looking at this photograph probably is a continuation of that examination. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the creative process in, in, in my case. I think about things and then sometimes many years later uh, there will be an echo or a, a reflection of the idea. So probably there's a direct line between this compositional attitude. I could discuss all these pictures in terms of their compositions, but uh, I'm interested in the real, the real movements in my work. So now it's 1980 and I've, uh, I'm still licking my wounds over theorem, my minimal color. And I start working with the 90 millimeter lens in black and white. And I start doing this series entitled the Black Series, where the idea of black is a big part of the meaning of the picture. And they're very subtractive, they're minimal, they're architectural details. You can see the inspiration for this work in previous series. There's a continuity. But the funny thing is, I worked on the Black Series from 80 to 83 and it was the most successful series I had ever made. It sold as a group to many museums. I had to show the Pompidou of just the black series. And it influenced me in many ways, but it was the direct result of my investigations in theorem, those minimal color pieces. So now we have another example of process. We learn after the process, never before, in my case. So after, after 1977, my exhibition at Castelli with, with quadrants, I, I realized I really want to do something very, very different. I want to take a step. I don't want to repeat. And I want to do some color work that's just color about color because it's color. Uh, <clears throat> in those days, uh, we were, worked in color negative and uh, I made this series, I worked on it for two, three years, I had the show, and it was a huge disaster. It was, everybody hated this show, and, and uh, there was a, a, a great uh, German-American photographer in New York, Hans Namuth, who made those great pictures of Jackson Pollock, and I was having lunch with Hans, and I said, Hans, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done this series theorem in my the color series, and he says, Ralph, he says, we make no mistakes. <laughs> well, this is an interesting story. So I went from theorem over to this next series, which we'll discuss now. This series, Political Abstraction, deals with an idea that's concerned me for a long time. I'm under the impression that any artist is reflecting the society within which they were born, within, within which they, they live. Art history has indicated this. We look at the Renaissance, the French, the German, the, the Italian painters, we see the world in which they lived. Uh, that was before air travel. I've worked extensively in, in Europe throughout my entire career, and I've traveled through Asia and photographed and recently I noticed <clears throat> that my photographs were reflecting something about the fact that if I look at this work in political abstraction, there's something like eight or nine different countries represented here. 
But basically, the photographs all look like I made them a couple blocks outside of my studio in New York. They're not necessarily reflecting the countries I'm in. So this told me that, that my society has provided me with a visual imprint that I take everywhere I go. Now, this is different from a visual signature. A visual signature is how somebody looks at something. But just like, uh, just like this lens was made in Germany, I was made in Los Angeles. In 2012, uh, Leica approached me uh, asking if I would be interested in uh, endorsing uh, Leica monochrome. I said, no, no, uh, I'm not really interested in, in digital. They said, well, could we send you the prototype anyway? I said, all right, I'm going to Australia. So I went to Australia for a show and uh, I was giving a lecture at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and I showed all my work and then I said, any questions? I said, yes, sir. I said, What's your name? He says, well, I'm Dive. I said, excuse me? No, I'm Dive. I said, what is that? He says, my name is Dave. No, I'm Dive. I said, oh, Dave, good. What is the question? <clears throat> he said, what about digital? Oh, digital. And I had prepared an answer. I said, the history of photography has been etched into the emulsion of black and white film and digital will resist the epic pursuit. And that took care of Dave. So then I come back to my studio from Australia and there's this FedEx box on the desk and I open it, it's this, this monochrome prototype. So I go to see my shrink and I put it on automatics, the only thing, and I said, I don't know what to do with this. I have 50 years in the darkroom digital. This could be kind of risky. And so while I'm leaving her office, I'm looking at it and I'm focusing on this manhole. And uh, as I'm focusing, this bicycle comes through the picture. And I click and I look at the display on the back and I says, that looks like it could have been taken by me. And I realized instantly that digital understood my look. And since that instant, I have not put a roll of black and white film in any of my cameras. Since 2012, I have worked exclusively digital. I am very interested in the language. It's different, but the same. I can talk about the moon, la lune, la luna, three different languages, same object, slightly different. I like this different. I had learned everything the darker was going to teach me. I like the speed of digital. I like the fact that I'm working now as though I had a studio with 10 assistants. I take pictures, I download them, I reflect upon them, I sleep and I dream about them. And the next morning I go out and it starts again. At this point in my life, I love the fact that time is moving for me about as fast as it's moving for the rest of the world. Uh, I did my first nude photograph in 1961, of a, a beautiful woman I was living with at the time. And uh, I was fascinated by the subject. It's probably the very oldest subject in, in the history of art. Uh, on my desk today, I have a little reproduction of the Willendorf Venus, which uh, I continue to study. And uh, the human figure, primarily in my case, the female figure, uh, has a characteristic which is that any idea that I have, <clears throat> like in quadrants, one meter, in surrealism, abstraction, in minimalism, it doesn't matter what I'm thinking about, I can always find an example of my current thoughts in the figure. Now, uh, I never took it very seriously. It was just always there. There were a the few I did every year. Then I started doing uh, workshops around, around the world. And it occurred to me that I could unify my audience, uh, my students, just by uh, photographing the figure. Because what you learn from photographing the figure, you can apply 
to almost any other subject. This is uh, one of the reasons it's such an academic standard to learn how to draw, perceive, look at, understand the nude. Anything you're going to examine in any other subject, proportion, scale, volume, distance, composition, tonality, light, all these components are uh, reflected in the figure. Uh, I haven't done one for a while, uh, but I do have a workshop coming up next year where we'll, we'll discuss the, the subject. It's really an eternal subject. Of course.